It's Platt, and today we head back across the pond. That's next to Platt's Beer of the Week. So the uh, particular beer we have today is Boddington's Pub Ale, one of the great uh, names in British brewing. Um, this beer is produced by Boddington's Brewing, located in Manchester, UK. Now a little background into Boddington's. Uh, Boddington's was originally started as Strange Ways Brewing in the year 1778. Apparently the Revolutionary War did not slow things down over in the UK, so still building breweries. Breweries started by two gentlemen, Thomas Coyster, hopefully I'm saying that right, and Thomas Fry. They were both grain merchants and realized uh, at their mill, their thirsty employees get off work and go drink beer. So they thought, well, let's make a buck or two off these guys and sell them uh, beer. And they also had access to grain at the time, too, so it does kind of make sense. Um, the brewery had, had a solid start, uh, but the next big change came in uh, 18... Uh, 32, and they hired a gentleman named Harry Boddington. Harry was brought on as a traveling salesman, and a lot of, um, like a lot of icons in the brewing business, he hit the ground running and uh, really took uh, a liking to the business. Uh, eventually, 15 years later, they made Harry a partner in the brewery in um, 1848, and then um, Eventually, five years later in 1853, Harry was able to organize the funds and get a loan to purchase the brewery outright. Now, over the next 24 years, Harry grew the brewery rapidly. They went from 10,000 barrels of year production-wise to 100,000 barrels per year. Uh, a lot of craft breweries here in the States would love to do those kind of numbers today. So obviously back then, that was uh, pretty impressive. Uh, but it was the next generation, Harry's son, William, that ended up taking the company public in 1888. They went public. Uh, that's always kind of an important next step in the arc of growing. Also allows the family to cash out a little bit, uh, which they did. Now, unfortunately, about 12 years later, though, Boddington's was involved in kind of a historic, uh, infamous uh, note in the history of beer. In, the, in 1900, uh, there was a beer poisoning epidemic that hit several breweries in England. Now, unlike some poisoning incidents here in the U.S., uh, if you're a certain age, you might remember the Tylenol poisonings in the early uh, 1980s. This, uh, come to find out, was not intentional. Uh, at first, they didn't know what was going on. Uh, what was happening at the time was, apparently in Manchester, doctors noticed a, you know, a lot of the local town drunks coming in saying they were sick, but a lot of the doctors were like, well, you're drunk. Yeah, you're supposed to be sick. But what a couple of doctors started noticing was, well, my gin drinkers and my whiskey drinkers aren't having this problem. It's my beer drinkers. And they started doing a little investigation, worked their way back to the breweries, where they realized that these people were, were uh, suffering from arsenic poisoning. Now, where was the arsenic coming from? Well, today we have what we call adjunct beers or adjunct lagers, where they use other fermentables besides barley to produce the beer. Uh, here in the U.S., corn syrup is popular. Anheuser-Busch uses rice solids. Um, and this makes beer brewing a little cheaper. Well, they didn't just, we didn't just run into cheap breweries in the last few years. This has been going on a while. In the early 1900s, the breweries in England were just literally adding straight sugar. At the time in sugar production, they used sulfuric acid in the production of it. Well, apparently through this process, somehow arsenic then was getting into the sugar, which is shipped to the breweries. People started getting poisoned. Uh, it, unfortunately, over 6,000 people were poisoned and 70 died. Uh, really a big incident. Uh, thank goodness they were able to figure this out. Um, oddly enough, though, if you think about it, even today with our FDA here in the U.S. and safety protocols, you still see recall on beef and pork and chicken and even lettuce, you know, produce. Every once in a while, you'll, you'll get some kind of fecal contamination. But you really haven't heard this from a brewery. That's why the story really kind of stuck out to me and I thought it was kind of unique. Uh, the next little bit of history for Boddington's came in 1940. Uh, when the brewery was hit by a German bomb during what was called the Manchester Blitz, 
uh, during World War II. The brewery's down for a while. They were able to outsource the production until they got the brewery back up and running. As far as the modern day history of the brewery, uh, Bonnie Tents was purchased in 2000 by Interbrew. Now, Interbrew is the parent company of Stella that eventually became InBev. And then when they mer merged with Anheuser-Busch, became AB InBev. So, uh, Bonnie Tents is part of the uh, corporate behemoth known as AB InBev. Um, Bonnie Tents just produces two beers. They produce a Draft Bitters and then the Pub Ale, which we'll try today. Both these beers are nitrogenated, which means they're carbonated with nitrogen and not CO2. Kind of gives a, a creamier mouthfeel, different mouthfeel to it. Also, the carbonation it just doesn't blow anywhere if you pour it real aggressive. Uh, the draft bitters is 3.5% alcohol by volume, and this is 4.6. Um, their bitters is the sixth best-selling bitters in the UK. Bitters, which is kind of a pale ale, uh, is probably the most popular style over there. Kind of like here, everywhere, you know, we have uh, IPAs over there. Bitters are uh, popular. Well, before we try this beer, though, let's check out the stats. So today, since we're trying a uh, British beer, I thought I would talk about a topic that I've kind of become enamored with is the fact that these, these major breweries in Britain also get to own their own pub chains and, and kind of, uh, they have access to a different business model than what breweries do here. And I, I don't know why, but that kind of fascinates me. So today I'm going to list the top five pub chains in the UK. Uh, first is number five, Young & Company. They run roughly 250 pubs across the UK. And just to add a little context, uh, Great Britain square mileage wise is smaller than the state of Texas, but they have more people. Um, the idea that there's two, you know, some par, pub chain would have 250 pubs in the state of Texas just boggles my mind. There, there, there's not even 250 Whataburgers in the state of Texas. And they love Whataburger down there. Uh, so 250 pubs in a country the size of England, that does kind of fascinates me. And that's only number five. Number four is Wet Bread. They own uh, not just pubs, but they own 750 Premier Inns and 100, I, I'm hopefully I'm saying this right, I'm sure somebody will correct me, Table Table Restaurants. Apparently that's a chain there. Uh, that's another interesting thing I find about this, the business model they have over there is it's understandable if you had a brewery that, man, I'd love to have a chain of pubs where I can sell my beer. Um, kind of like the BJ Brewing pub chain here, which is a different little variation on that. Um, but that seems cool. But the idea of also running a hotel with the brewery, that, that's just a two different businesses and business models. And you don't see the Marriott chains or the Holiday Inn chains having, you know, their own chain of restaurants in their hotels either. So I, I, I found that fascinating. Uh, number three is Stonegate. Stonegate owns 700 various pubs, restaurants throughout their various brands. Uh, number two is JD. Let me see, make sure I'm wearing it. Weatherspoon. 925 pubs in Great Britain and Ireland. Apparently, Ireland has a similar business model, too, or allows breweries to run, you know, pub chains, too. And number one is Mitchell and Battler. Uh, they run 1,784 various pubs, restaurants, bars. Uh, in Great Britain. I believe all these companies are publicly traded. Now, something I'd like a little feedback from you, especially if anybody uh, is watching this from the UK, uh, are those pub chains considered kind of cool? Or is it like, would I look at one of the, if I lived in Great Britain, when I look at one of those pubs away here in the US, we might look at an Applebee's or a Chili's or a Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, or, you know, to somebody on a Friday night, like, hey, let's go to you know, Stonegate Pub and just rage, you know, uh, like somebody may or may not hear, go to TGI Fridays and party. But I'm just fascinated by that uh, business model. And uh, one of these days I'm going to get over there and I might have to hit a few of them. Well, enough about that. Let's drink some beer. You may or may not have heard there was a little rattle in there. There's a the nitrogen cartridge. Like I said, these are nitrogen in it. And we're going to let this set a little bit. You'll see it's all head bill eventually shrink down because, uh, again, nitrogen is just a little different. So we'll let this uh, settle. 
Don't want to waste your drop there. Um, like I said, the, the, the main difference between this pub ales and the bitters is pretty much just the ABV. Uh, the bitter or the pub ale is pretty much what they export. Uh, I have not seen, I don't think I've seen the draft bitters here in the U.S. It may or may not be, but I don't think I've ever seen it. But the pub ale is, is more their kind of export. All right, let's give her a try. Oh, man, that's nice. I really like these nitrogenated beers, that creamy head, um, which, once it settles, at least a good finger's worth plus. Nice maltiness. Um, man, that's just a nice, well-balanced beer. Um, just a hint of the bitterness in the back. Uh, like I said, this is based off a bitter style, but don't let that throw you off. Uh, compared to the Coors Light, Bud Light, or whatever you may have grown up with, yes. But in the world of triple IPAs, no, this is not a bitter beer. Plenty of maltiness up front. The nitrogen gives it a nice mouthfeel to it. Like I said, just a hint of the bitters in the back. There's no real hop on the nose. Again, the, you know, it's called a pub ale. This is just something I could sit in a pub, throw darts, and just drink it. <laughs> drink plenty of. Uh, it's not a beer that's going to change the world, but it might um, get you feeling right. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good product. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or beers that you'd like me to try, please leave them in the comment section, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Till next time, bottoms up.